hello everyone thank you for returning back to my channel um we're going to look at a game uh between vladimir artemiev with the white pieces and alexander grishuk with the black pieces we start this position here on move 25 artemiev with the white pieces has just played the move queen a4 so first question i want to ask everyone is should Grishchuk, who is black, trade queens here? So I would like you just to pause the video at this point and just ponder the position in your mind and think about that question. Should black trade uh, queens? So while you're thinking about that, I want to say that Chess Audiobooks is on LeeChess.com and also on Chess.com. Uh, all right, so if you want to play or just uh, message me or friend request me, I'm uh, playing on those uh, two sites. Also, Instagram, the same name, Chess Audio uh, Books. All right, so let's turn back uh, to this position here. Again, Artemiev has the white pieces. Grishchuk has the black pieces. In this position... Grishchuk chose to go into the end game here. And we'll look at alternatives later. But queen takes a4 was played. And now rook takes a4 by Artemiev. And now we are going to discuss this end game uh, position here. Now you might say, well, what are all the arrows for? I'm showing basic plan of white in the position and the problems in the position for black and I am also indirectly answering the question here by the highlights if black should have traded the queens here so let's talk about it first we have the rook on the third rank all right and I have the arrow going down to e1 and to a1 so the idea of course for black excuse me for white is just simply double up the rooks on the a file and pressure that isolated pawn on a6 I have the knight highlighted you can see white's knight on d3 is very powerfully placed as it has many options it protects the pawn on b2 it also eyes the weak squares that black has in his camp on e5 and c5 respectively all right Black, on the other hand, again, is handicapped by this isolated pawn on a6, which must be constantly uh, guarded by pieces. Another main problem in this position for black is the knight on d7. Very, very passive, and is clearly the worst piece on the board. So before I go any further, I want to just... Uh, give you a brief outline of the uh, concepts that I want you to keep in mind and learn in this video. So I'll mention them now and then I'll mention them in conclusion at the end of this video. So we're going to talk about one, two weaknesses, the principle of two weaknesses. We are going to talk about active versus passive pieces, which I uh, slightly alluded to. We're going to talk about bad piece, which I talked about just now. And we are going to talk about, uh, for the importance of counterplay. All right. So let's go on with those concepts in mind. The principle of two weaknesses, active versus passive pieces, bad piece, and the importance of counterplay. All right. And as each thing comes up, I'll go off on a mini tangent and discuss them. So Grishchuk played H5 here. Now, a better move here, probably to reposition uh, this knight, right? This is his worst piece. So perhaps a move like knight F6 is a little better. Knight F6. Um, definitely puts the knight on a better square as 
the knight could possibly hop to e4 eventually but also has the option of going back to e8 and then could position itself on d6 although the knight has the option to position itself on c7 freeing the rooks from the protection of the pawn so you're taking a lesser uh, value piece and using it on defensive duty as opposed to having the rook on b6 be responsible for that pawn so play could go knight b4 for instance rook a8 rook e1 right with the idea of going to a1 knight e8 and knight c7 and you can see here that all of black pieces are offensively placed all of white pieces are the white pieces are uh, uh, well placed offensively all of black pieces are passive and defensive uh, here all right so Grishchik instead of playing knight f6 plays h5 all right and this a uh, part of this idea is to stop the expansion on the king side um uh, by white so rook e1 carrying out the plan rook c8 and the idea from grishchuk here is to again use utilize this knight to go to b8 and keep an eye on the a6 pawn and uh free the rooks here rook e a1 knight b8 now rook b4 black is off excuse me white is offering the trade of pieces and again it would bring after rook takes b4 it would just bring more uh pressure on the a6 square as the um knight will come to b4 and there's no way for black to legitimately protect the a6 pawn therefore rook c6 trade of rooks and now b4 b4 gets rid of the problem of the backward b pawn as it is no longer backwards it also aids in fixing the a6 pawn and even though there's a new weakness created on c3 white does not need to worry about that because he can always put his knight on a c5 and the weakness on c3 is covered all right so again we want to point out active pieces versus passive pieces so we can see white's pieces are active ready to attack putting constant pressure on the black position and we see blacks pieces are very passive and this is why even though the position is quite simplified white has an advantage here because he has actively placed pieces right actively placed pieces or pieces that are attacking uh, points in the enemy position whether they be pawns pieces or squares and active uh pieces are pieces with scope in general rooks on open files rooks on semi open files etc so compare for example the a1 rook to the rook that is on b6 the b6 rook has little scope it actually has um four squares that it can go to the knight on b8 is just at home as it hasn't as if it hasn't even been developed yet meanwhile the knight on d3 has a plethora of options all right so one way to gauge uh the health of your pieces if you're not sure is to look at their uh scope and their range usually as a rule of thumb the more scope the more range a piece has the better off it is and as you can see the rook on a1 and the knight on d3 have plenty of scope Grish should play king f8 king f1 king e7 king e2 from Artemiev, king d6 g4 and now Grish should plays the move h4 um risky move because that pawn uh can uh be attacked if he plays uh the move for instance let's say after knight c5 which was played in the game let's say Grishchik played g5 to try to protect that pawn 
Well, after King E3, White has an easy plan of breakthrough with F4. And White will either end up with a pass pawn on G4, or if he tries to take, he'll be able to exploit the open F file at some point. Another option is H takes G4. H takes G4. And let's say um, F6. Knight C5. Putting pressure on A6 pawn. And E5. Notice how um, Black obtains uh, a counterplay. Although he's slightly worse. He obtains counterplay. And instead of H4, perhaps... The move H takes G4 was better in that it allows um, Black to obtain counterplay. This is another one of the points that I mentioned at the beginning of the video. It's important to have some counterplay so that your opponent is not able to just put constant pressure on you and have you in a cycle of defense nonstop. So in this position... Artemiev is just attacking the A pawn, putting a lot of pressure on the black position and causing the pieces of black to be very passive. All right. Now, black has a preponderance of pawns in the center. That's where he is strong at. And therefore, he should be trying to push uh, these pawns. Okay, starting with moves like F6 and then E5 eventually. All right. It's very important to have counterplay. Without counterplay, your opponent can basically run roughshod in the position and do whatever he or she likes to do without fear of a counter strike. So, for example, after h takes g4, h takes g4, f6, yes, white still has his attack, his pressure on a6, but black at least has his counter striking abilities. E5, D takes, F takes E5, King D3, King C7. Again, this is a sample line. Rook A5, G5, F3. Again, black, um, uh, excuse me, white is doing what he's supposed to do as far as stopping the pawn preponderance in the center. Rook F6, and there's some counter play, right? Attacking the F3 pawn, so King E2, Rook C6. King e3 and rook d6 just a sample line and again white is still better but black is putting up some resistance here in the game h4 was played knight c6 all right white's plan is obvious just pressuring this uh a pawn at this point king c6 was played and now F4, all right? And this is where I want to take the time to talk about the principle of two weaknesses, all right? So, so far we talked about active versus passive pieces. We talked about the bad piece, which is the knight, okay? And we talked about the importance of counterplay by showing you the example of F6, E5, and with black having a pawn preponderance in the center, how he should be trying to push the center pawns. Right, to create a distraction for white so that he is not just on the offensive continuously. So now we're going to talk about principle of two weaknesses. All right. The principle of two weaknesses is basically to paraphrase uh, a very useful principle whereby if you're attacking um, uh, one weak point in the opponent's position, the opponent can easily defend. All right. Um, I like to say uh, steal a phrase from jujitsu from John Danaher ex um, actually uh, one of the top uh, coaches in jujitsu right now and he says you don't want to create problems for your opponent you want to create dilemmas dilemmas are two pronged problems that occur at the same time dilemmas and trilemmas so if I create give you one problem to solve Okay, for instance, here we see white attacking a6. 
Okay, black has equal material and black is able to defend. Yes, his pieces are passive, but he's still able to defend. However, if I create two problems at the same time, now the dilemma is created. Meaning, in this particular case is applied to chess, that the opponent won't be able to defend both problems. And if you create even more problems, for instance, a trilemma, now you create three problems at the same time. The opponent won't have the resources or mobility to be able to address all of the problems that occur in a position. All right. This is especially true as the opponent's pieces are bad already. Again, I mentioned earlier that rook on b6 has no scope. The knight on b8 is bad. So if you create a, a problem on the other side of the board, there is no reasonable a solution or a way for black to be able to address the new problem that's the principle of the two weaknesses you put a lot of pressure on the first weakness you create a second one and then all of a sudden when it's when you're prepared you switch your attack to the other weakness and the opponent often does not have uh, the mobility to be able to switch and defend all right because in in general the uh, side with the the uh, pieces right the better pieces are going to be able to have more scope more range and be able to um, switch position quickly for example the rook on a1 can easily go to the f1 on one move it's harder for the rook on b6 to defend right so f4 was played Bishop played um, king d6. All right. Another idea is king b5. Rick a5 check. And let's say king c4 trying to attack the c pawn. Most of you can see that it's a precarious looking position for the black king as he is walking into a mating net. So king d2. Let's say g6 for example. I just do that in there. King c2. That's the idea. And then there's really no stopping the knight uh, from, say, going to a4 and then b2 uh, checkmate. Okay. I just wanted to throw that in there. So after f4, king d6 was played. King d3. And king c6. If g6 here, then just g5. Isolating the H pawn. So King C6 and Rook F1 again, creating a dilemma. Now, what are you going to do about this idea of F4 and F takes E6? Again, another powerful idea here is just G5 with the idea of attacking. This now isolated pawn in the h-file. So g6 and the king would just simply walk over. Another viable idea. And just simply winning the pawn. There's really no way to stop that. However, Artemiev chose rook f1. King d6. And now f5. King e7. F takes e6. F takes e6. Now I have highlighted all the weaknesses that show up all of a sudden. Remember, there was only one weakness. It was that A6 pawn. Now we have three weaknesses on the board. Now we have a trilemma. Now look at black's pieces. Is black able to ward off white's attack at this point? No, he isn't. First move, Artemiev plays is G5 in order to attack the isolated pawn on H4. Now e5 to just a desperation move to create counterplay is a little bit too late. Not only to create counterplay, but to increase the scope of the uh, rook. Remember, I was telling you this rook is bad, so now this rook can enter into the game. 
D takes E5, Rook G6, King D4. Uh, Rook F5 is is winning also, perfectly playable. Also is this move E6. King D4, acceptable also. Rook takes G5, King D5. And at this point, Grishchik is uh, lost. Rook F7. Rook takes G7. 95 check. And I'll give the rest of the moves without any uh, commentary here. As Artemiev brought home the point, you can see black is just too little too late. His rook is active now, but, you know, down material. Pawn is getting ready to queen. He's forced to give up the knight. Rook H1. The rooks belong behind past pawns. H3 and knight G4. King D8 and then knight F2. So the pawn, H pawn will be picked up uh, either by the rook or knight and the party's over. So... Again, I hope you enjoyed that game. In conclusion, once again, the points we wanted to drive home, the two principal two weaknesses, you saw with the plan, attacking the A6 pawn, then playing the move F4, Rook F1, F5, uh, exchanging, and all of a sudden you had three weaknesses. So remember, don't create problems, create dilemmas, right? Problem is just, you know, just one issue. Create more than one issue so that the opponent can't deal with all of the uh, prongs of the problems. So create, it, create two and three-headed monsters. Point number two, active versus passive pieces. Remember, you want to be active. Three, bad piece. Remember, one bad piece can make the difference in the evaluation of the whole entire uh, position. There's a famous game, um, uh, Karpov versus Wolfgang Ullman. Where Omen just had one bad piece. I think it was a knight also. Alright. One bad piece. And in this case. Uh, when we looked at the position. Earlier. We saw. Before the uh, the queen trade. That knight was already terrible. On. Um, D7. Again look at the differences. Between the two knights. The white knight is playing defense and at the same time ready to hop into e5 or c5. The knight on d7 is totally passive, just basically guarding the c5 square, guarding the e5 square, hoping and praying that nothing happens. All right. And finally, we talked about counterplay, the importance of counterplay. So even if you're worse, you want to have you want to have something going on. You just don't want to be totally stuck on offense or uh, defensive cycles, just constantly defending, ducking, dodging, hoping not to get checkmated, hoping not to lose material. You don't want to be constantly like that. All right. You want to have counterplay. When you have counterplay, your opponent can't just concentrate on attacking your position, tearing and breaking your position down. Well, you don't have any counterplay. The opponent can just focus on the destruction of your position. All right. Unfortunately for Grishchuk, the counterplay came too late when he played e5 and brought the rook to g6, etc. So those are the uh, lessons uh, gleamed from this game. To answer the question at the very beginning, if you didn't figure that out, figure that out now, uh, Grishchuk should have not should have not traded queens. As you see, he went right into an inferior endgame, so he misevaluated this. Um, better for Grishchuk. In this position, play a move like queen c7 or maybe queen c8. But, for example, queen c7, queen a5. It's a possible line. This is like an engine line right here. Giving up the exchange. I mean the, um, the queens for the uh, rook and the queen c8. It's more like a realistic line. Yeah, I'm just going fast uh, fast here. but And you can see the move E5 with the idea of undermining this knight on uh, C, uh, C5. Again, white is still better. But again, with the queens on, 
black has more chances um, for t- uh, tactical um, counterplay here. So to answer that question, so it avoided the uh, queen trade. So we know what happened after that, right into this inferior uh, ending. Of course, it's natural for black to think that he had good chances with both rooks down on the semi-open B file, but um, he underestimated the power and strength of White's attacking chances on the A pawn and also underestimated the strength of the D3 knight. So I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please hit the thumbs up button. Please like and subscribe to my channel and please check the links below. I always have books and videos um, that you could uh, purchase in order to support my channel. Um, and also consider donating uh, to the channel also. Thank you very much. And I will see you guys in the comment section.